Hello and welcome back to Falling Walls Breakthrough Conversations. This is your opportunity to engage with global leaders, outstanding scientists, emerging innovators and science entrepreneurs. I'm Nicola Jones and I'm the Head of Publishing for the Spring and Nature Sustainable Development Goals Programme. And I'm joined today by... Liz Madarash, the CEO of Polyloop, and Monica Felu Mohe, who is the Falling Walls Breakthrough Science Engagement winner, as announced yesterday. Um, for the next 25 minutes, we'll be finding out more about their projects. Some technical details before we start. If anybody in the audience would like to ask a question, and we very much encourage this, please use the raise hand function in Zoom, and you'll be spotlighted and unmuted and then asked to invited to ask your question. If you have any uh, technical questions, please use the chat function, and the conversation will be recorded and made available on the Falling Walls website afterwards. So welcome Liz and Monica. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, okay, to start things off, Monica, maybe you could tell us about the project that won you the Falling Walls Breakthrough of the Year. My pleasure. Yeah, um, my project is called Aquí Nos Cuidamos, in which in Spanish it, it loosely translates to uh, here we take care of each other. So it's a project um, that I lead in Puerto Rico. Um, and it's a project that connects um, scientists, the scientific community with community leaders in Puerto Rico. It's focused on COVID-19 prevention and promoting vaccination against COVID and also mental health. Um, and what's unique about the project is that we it's community centered, so we really spotlight community leaders, um, local grassroots leaders who are working with their communities to support them to make sure that they can meet their basic needs, but also respond to crises and disasters like the pandemic. Um, so we've been doing this project for, for about a year, and it's really about not just community, but science and, and solidarity. And how did you start to bring this project together? So this project started in uh, September of 2020. Um, it was in direct response to, to the pandemic. I'm a scientist by training, but I've been doing science communication for about 15 years. Um, I, myself, and, and a lot of my colleagues, we were doing a lot of media engagement and answering questions. You know, there was a lot of uncertainty um, in those first few months of the pandemic. And we realized that there was an opportunity uh, to support the work of community leaders in, in Puerto Rico because we have so many crises every day. Community leaders uh, really take an important role in, in supporting their, their neighbors, in making sure that their basic needs are met. Um, and so we thought we could create resources that are science-based, but they're accessible, that allow people to use science in practical ways to protect themselves from, from COVID. Um, because in, in a public health emergency, having access to timely, relevant, science information that you can use can be the difference between illness and health. Um, and so we created this, uh, this toolkit, a multimedia toolkit that people can use to, um, to promote COVID prevention, to promote mental health. Um, but we also realized there was an opportunity to directly engage with the community leaders who were doing the work in and support them. And how did the engagement with community leaders lead you to the impacts that you've had? It's been it's been crucial. Uh, I mean, they are at our ambassadors. I mean, community leaders, they know what their communities need. They have science knowledge. They use it even though they're not recognized as a stereotypical science expert. They are. Um, and, and so listening to what their needs and priorities are has directly informed what resources we have created, what strategies we have used in our in our project. Um, it has really shaped what we have done. Um, for example, we've been working with the deaf community in Puerto Rico, and that was because a connection we made with a community leader in the deaf community, and that's really, you know, we have interpreters, sign language interpreters for everything we do. Um, and, and that was, again, a direct result of that relationship. So that, the, that trust and meaningful relationship we've established with community leaders has really shaped what we do because we have really co-created the project with these leaders. Fantastic. Now, Liz, turning to you and Polyloop, could you tell us a bit about what, what you do? 
Sure, thank you. Um, the short version is that we make non-biodegradable plastics biodegrade. We do this by feeding plastic to bacteria. The longer story is that up until now, we've made more plastic than people, which is quite amazing, no, if you think about it. And most of that plastic is still out there. It's not like it's disappearing because we made a non-natural material that nature doesn't recognize. We made it to last and we didn't have the foresight to think about what's going to happen next. It was cheap, malleable, and our plastic consumption is still growing. And what we saw is that all these legislations were, were coming about, but really they had no real impact. And legislation without technology is quite useless, to be frank. Even even the, the EU legislation on, uh, on the ban of single-use plastics will bring the, uh, the marine plastic down 0.06%. So it's nothing without technologies to combat plastic getting into the environment and alter alternative technologies to plastic. And the way we saw it is that this is the biggest problem, that nature doesn't recognize this material. So we have to engineer something which does exactly this and, can loop, and then we can loop it back into the ecosystem so that it can be part of, of nature again, which, which it was, but millions of years ago. Wonderful. That sounds really exciting and extremely timely innovation. Now we have a question from the audience. Uh, so if you'd like to please go ahead and ask our speakers. Hi. So my question is for Monica. Um, I'm specifically uh, interested in um, COVID uh, vaccine skepticism. <clears throat> have you found that um, your in-person engagement um, or if you can compare your in-person engagement strategies with your online ones, what, what, what have you found has been most effective uh, in countering that skepticism? Um, thank you for that question. We haven't really done much in-person engagement ourselves, like my team and I. Most of the engagement we've done has been online because of, of COVID. Um, but the community leaders and, and ambassadors that we've been working with, they have um, been, been doing in-person engagement. And so what's been really important for us is that uh, that they have that direct contact with the communities that they're serving. Um, it's also been really important that, that those communities, those leaders have the trust of their communities. For example, um, you know, we've created videos, audios, written materials, images, infographics that our leaders are using to then go out into their communities. Um, and you know, some of them are going door by door. Some of them are, ch are sharing this information on, on WhatsApp. And so just culturally in Puerto Rico, that kind of face-to-face in-person contact is really important. Um, but what I would say is also very important is trust. If you have in-person contact with someone, but that person doesn't trust you, it doesn't matter as much um, as whether, you know, that, that trusting relationship. And so one thing that we have done to support our community leaders is not just give them the content and the materials, but also uh, train them to how to answer questions, how to deal with misinformation, disinformation, uh, and skepticism, you know, understanding why are people skeptical. Um, it's often because they are fearful or they don't have trust in a government or institution. And so we're teaching them to understand what's behind that mistrust and then what uh, communication strategies they can use to deal with it. Also to understand that you are not going to be able to change everyone's minds. Because um, I think that's really important. We want people to get vaccinated, of course, but it's important to understand some people are not going to necessarily change their minds. Thank you. Um, now, both of you have been involved with things that have taken science from out of the lab, from out of the university. Liz, in your case, into a startup, and Monica, in your case, into community engagement. Could you both tell us a bit about how you got to this point? What, what led you here? Liz, would you like to start? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, 
it's kind of complicated because the way we saw it is that we still work with universities, with a lot of research institutions. It's good. It really helps us. But if we put it in, the way we saw it is that if we put it in a different form, if we put it in a company, we can grow much faster and achieve results much faster than if we just stay in academia, which is notoriously slower than industry can be. And by, by managing academia in a more commercial setting, we're able to attain results much faster. So we can, we can think about months, not years. Yeah, I like to say that I'm academic adjacent. I still work in academic settings and I work, I actually work with a lot of scientists. But I mean, part of it, a big part of how I got here is it boils down to who I am. Um, I was born and raised in Puerto Rico. I grew up in a rural community that um, in many ways was marginalized. And so I've always had, a, a, for me, science and science communication and engagement have always been a tool for social justice. Um, and so even though, you know, I have a PhD and, and, you know, I was in academia for a long time, um, I always wanted, I, 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 I craved that connection with, with community because I've always thrived being in community. It's an important part of my identity. So I think it was only natural that I ended up doing this work, really connecting um, science with communities and really using science to serve communities. So it's really interesting to have you both in the conversation today because um, work on COVID and work on sustainability are, I think, increasingly being recognized as, as trying to solve grand challenges in that, that require collaboration, um, that require perspectives from multiple different groups, that require kind of collaboration and, and inclusion, um, and which also have been subject to a certain amount of skepticism from the outside world. So I'm, I'm interested to hear from both of you what have been the challenges along the way in getting to the points that you've got to. I mean, with our project uh, itself, I mean, because we work with communities and, and you know, especially when you're working with communities that have been marginalized and, and frankly abused by science and medicine, collaboration moves at the speed of trust. And often when you want to create impact, you want, you know, you want to have as much as impact as you can fast. And it doesn't happen that way. So you have to be adaptable. You have to think in the long term. Um, so with, with Aquí Nos Cuidamos, you know, we had a plan in mind. We wanted this to be a one-year project. And we actually have had to extend it to become a year and a half project. Uh, because we realized there's some things we can rush. Um, there's also some structural challenges. Like in Puerto Rico, power goes out every day. People don't have reliable internet. So I can't plan on doing things if people are not going to have power or internet, right? And so the the adaptability that requires, um, I think it's it's been both a challenge and an asset because our ability, like my, we are four people in, in my team, and our ability to adapt and, and respond to the needs of the community have been really, really important for our success too. I think for us, it has been to actually try to make people understand the complexity of the issue. Because people oftentimes think that it's only a trash issue. It's just, it's just there, it hurts my eyes, but it doesn't really do much else. But by now, I think many people have started to realize that plastic is much more than meets the eye. It's the, it's the microplastics in our food, our beverages. It's the additives that are in there. It's the carbon emissions. It's, it's basically a lot of things mashed into one. And uh, for example, I oftentimes get this question, who are our competitors? And what I try to emphasize is that no one is our competitor in the sense that the problem is so huge that we need a lot of solution. So it's not an or question, but an end question. And uh, we truly believe that good sustainable methods are needed. They're vital to the continuation of our species because this is the only habitable planet that we know of. Let's 
like get that straight. And uh, this is why we want to work together with with everyone, not not compete with recycling, for example, but help them to solve their additives issues, for example, to make the to make the solution truly impactful and sustainable. Where, where, where the sustainability um, doesn't get degraded. Yeah. And if, if I can add to that, I think you're absolutely right, Liz. As I was listening to you, you know, I was thinking, you know, the, some of the inequalities and inequities we are trying to address, and, you know, with a, a global pandemic, it is also a complex issue. And it made me think about, you know, when you're dealing with such complex issues, sometimes it can be really overwhelming and you're like, there's just no way that I'm going to be able to solve this. It's such a big problem. There is not a thing I, as an individual, can do, um, which is why I think community is so powerful, right? Because, I mean, we can all do something, right? Small actions, they accumulate. But then if you work on them on community, especially if you're bringing together a broad coalition, a broad and diverse community of people with different expertise, um, you know, that can bring different perspectives and solutions and thinking outside the box, you know, not thinking about just experts as people with academic training, but community leaders as experts, like that's what's going to move the needle on on these grand challenges. Just building a bit on that, um, I would like to add that there is a lot of inequality and pollution. And to gap this inequality, I think that community is very, very important. And uh, people in, in rich countries also have to understand that some things might be good for you, but in other other countries, people are experiencing the, the effects of your actions here. And with community, I think we can bridge those those inequalities and fill those gaps in, in the long term. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the implementation of your, your project, your technology, and also about how this could be scaled um, and adapted and taken further? Okay. Liz, do you want to go first? Sure, I'll start. Um, so our technology is... Even though the, the basis is, is simple, like feed plastic to bacteria, in fact, it's super complex, both because plastics are complex and natural living organisms are complex. Like plastics are polymers, they're additives, they're plasticizers, they're, they're these conundrum of things. And, and the living organism itself is, it's adaptable, but or also quite fragile in some cases. So for us to be able to scale, we have to nail down the science to an academic level. Here we circle back to why we still work with academia and why, why we think it's important to work with academia and then have peer review. So, because if we can nail the science, there's no, uh, there's no problem with scaling. It's just a matter of economics of scale. So in, in our case, uh, our, our end goal is to actually be able to reconvert plastics back into what they what they were, so plastic to plastic, with the enzymes that are secreted by the bacteria, and then on the super long term to to be able to uh, apply the bacteria themselves on the waste management side. Um, I, I, does that answer your question? Yes. Yes. I, I don't want to get into more <laughs> specific things. I mean, feel free to get as technical as you'd like. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, so, so what we're working on right now is to nail down the technology to working perfection, as we like to call it, because it's never going to be perf perfect, but it can have a working perfection. And then from there, scale two products, one, to one which is uh, plastic to plastic, which is quite important for plastic producers, which is a huge industry. Um, and uh, and we have to work together with them as well to prevent pollution and the other on the waste management side where, where we can actually go into these projects where we can clean up environments. Yeah, I mean, for us, the Aquí Nos Cuidamos is based on three core principles. It's community-centered. Like, we're really co-creating, engaging with the communities at every step of the way. It's evidence-based. We're not just drawing from the expertise that communities have, but we're also working with biomedical, social, behavioral scientists. We're drawing from design and communications expertise to inform our strategies. And then it's culturally 
relevant because we want to make sure that what we're doing is pertinent to the realities and context of the communities we're working with. And, you know, you can do those things anywhere. Um, and, and the other thing is, you know, what we do is really about science, solidarity, and community, and, and those exist pretty much everywhere too. So while the, the problem that we're working on you know, at this point was mostly COVID, then mental health, um, the, the strategies that we've been using can be applied to any problem. Um, it can be, they can be applied to work with many different communities. They can be adapted. Um, and, and so in terms of scaling, like for us, uh, uh, funding obviously would be really, really important. I think that would be important for anyone who wants to scale. Um, partnerships as well. Um, but you know, anybody who wants to do the type of work we are doing, I think it's it's transferable to pretty much anywhere where you know you want to connect, uh, put science in service of communities, particularly marginalized communities. Thank you. And then just one final question while we have some time. What advice would you give to anybody in our audience who's thinking about either um, more public engagement or launching a startup? Don't be afraid of doing it. Really, like, even, even if you work in a sustainability startup, the worst thing that can happen is that you try to save the world. It's, it's a it's a fine position to be in. So be brave, uh, be confident in what you know and what you can do and the team you can build. And uh, then you, you'll see where life takes you. So, yeah. I would say start where you are, use what you have and do what you can. Um, this is a quote from Arthur Ashe, who was a, an African-American tennis player. Um, and I love this quote because... It, it, it's helped me think about how I as an individual can tackle big problems. Like there is, I have expertise, I have privileges, I have contacts that can help me take action. Um, it doesn't have to start big. I can start small and do it well and then grow from there. Um, and so I would say, yeah, start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. Thank you. Thank you both uh, for really insightful, wonderful conversations, actually. I'm really excited to see um, where you and your projects go next. And um, for our audience, we will be back with another breakthrough conversation on the half hour. Please stay on the Zoom to join us then. Thank you very much.